Thank you, Monica. And welcome to Book Passage, and thank you for supporting this great independent bookstore and this great author. Um, I'm Sam Berry, and uh, since I'm going to be mentioned in this introduction, I'll just tell you who I am. I run a program called The Path to Publishing here at Book Passage, and uh, that is a program that helps people to get published. It's one of many things we do here to try to help writers uh, and authors reach their readers. And I'm proud to say I work with Peter Volte on that. Um, his book, Thanks, Giving and Receiving Gratitude for America's Troops. And of course, the book is for sale, and we'd like to, and afterwards, I'm sure Edgar is going to be signing, so that'd be great. Chaplain Edgar Welty, Jr. is a product of Book Passages Pathways to Publishing. His wife, Amy, bought Edgar in consultation with me, <laughs> and Edgar started writing known fiction books on veterans' affairs. Reverend Walty is a disabled veteran and VA patient. He served as a volunteer for the chaplains at the Veterans Administration San Francisco Medical Center. He was in uniform in the U.S. Army as a construction draftsman for four years from April 20th, 1976 until April 21st, 1980. His vocation as a minister of the Word and Sacrament in the United uh, is as a minister of the Word and Sacrament in the United Church of Christ. After earning a four-year Master of Divinity degree at San Francisco Theological Seminary, uh, an institution, by the way, which I also attended and got the same degree from, uh, he was ordained in 2000 for a call to a United Church of Christ congregation in Rochester, New York. From there, he served as pulpit supply in two evangelical Lutheran churches in, a, in, a, in a Lutheran Church in America congregations. The first was in the village of Cocotton, New York. Did I say that right? Yeah. <laughs> and the second was in Tiburon in the San Francisco Bay Area. He is in the process of writing and publishing two more books. The first is a book entitled Spiritual Insight Training for Veterans. The second will be called God and America's Wars. He is also planning a DVD on Christian symbolism. With his wife, Amy, a wedding dress designer, he is planning another book entitled Ceremony, Planning Your Perfect Wedding. That sounds great. He is a chaplain, captain in the 31st Regiment, United States Volunteers of America, and a member of the Disabled American Veterans, the Scottish American Military Society, and Vets to Vets. He lives with his wife, Amy, his cat, Willie, <laughs> I've never met Willie, his Chihuahua, Pete, in the Sleepy Hollow neighborhood near San Anselmo, California. Welcome. Thank you all for, thank you all for coming. And I'm going to start, I've got to, two readings, and perhaps we'll do three readings, depending on time. Uh, and the first one is called Simon Service, Walking the Extra Mile with America's Warriors. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. I tried to get away, but I was swept up by the mob. The crowd surged when Roman soldiers marched out the gate leading from the courtyard of their barracks onto the street. They were leading a man crowned with thorns who had been flogged almost to death. He was carrying the crossbeam on which he was to be crucified. To my horror, this hapless prisoner fell down in front of me into the filth of the street. Suddenly I felt the flat of a spur point settle onto my shoulder. I looked around and up the shaft of the spear into the disdainful face of a Roman soldier. He sneered and said, hey, you, pick up that crossbeam. A soldier shouted at me over the den of the crowd. This man's half dead, and we don't want him to die before we can hang him on this cross. Get a move on. We can't wait all day. Having just heard about the scene I have described, imagine you're hearing Simon of Serene speak. As a Jew from a district, distant, Roman community. Simon had arrived in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover at the temple. Simon's faith required him to celebrate its fe great festival each year and at least once in his life in the temple. His city at Sire and Rome's Liberia was distant from Ju Judea. 
Simon had traveled this distance at great effort and expense. His program to the temple promised to be his only chance to fulfill both an holy obligation and a lifelong dream. Simon also knew that the family portion of Passover would start as that Friday's daylight faded. He needed to finish at the temple, walk back through crowded streets, through a small gate in Jerusalem's wall, then back across the fields to his relative's farm, all before sundown. Simon had found him the street, self on the street next to the Roman barracks. Some the Pilate soldiers had appeared, leaving out a man to be crucified. Another Simon, who had been renamed Peter, remembered Jesus' teaching about soldiers pressing men into service. Peter had heard Jesus say, and whoever presses you into service to go one mile, go with him too. This term, to press into service, is the same as in Simon, the cross carrier's required service. This teaching of Jesus is knowing as going the extra or second mile. Compulsory service demanded by conquering armies had started with the Persians, continued with the Greeks, and then the Romans. In the first century, its most common form involved the demand that residents carry the baggage of Roman soldiers for one mile. Jesus asked his hearers not only to do this resented task the one mile, but to carry the enemy's baggage for a second or extra mile. Mm. Christians are called by Jesus to carry the burden of our enemies for an extra mile, and I do not buy the idea that this was merely a ploy to get enemy soldiers in trouble with their commanders. This was, in my view, an actual command of Jesus and should be understood as such. As Americans, we are called by common decency to walk with our warriors in active service and with our veterans for that extra mile, but it's hard for most Americans to even start walking that extra mile. Many people, particularly politicians, say they support the troops, but can we support the troops if we are disconnected from them? Today in Afghanistan, we have been involved in America's longest war. Our engagement in Iraqi was also drawn out, yet only 1% of Americans are involved in military service. What kind of support is America giving our troops? Sacrifice in the form of increased taxes? Of course not. Politicians, children sit into harm way, harm's way, very few. Recently, there's been an attempt to balance the federal budget by decreasing retirement for future military retirees and by increasing the co-pays and medical facilities for military-related patients. Many American politicians and their supporters aren't walking the first mile with our troops, the mile called for by common decency. But for those who aren't Christian, why should they heed the call of Jesus to walk an extra mile for troops with whom 99% of the public has no direct connection? First, our lifestyle depends on the world's sea lanes, which our Navy keeps open. From the time of our nation's founder, our Na Army has fought to secure our freedom. As we took our place among nations, our Marines were established as a rapid strike force. As the Cold War began, our Air Force separated from our Army to guard the skies against Soviet missiles and fighters. In the ongoing war on drugs, the Coast Guard has been key, and yes, members of the Coast Guard have been serving overseas in recent wars. Americans need to walk at least a mile for the vital role the military plays in our lives. And we must not forget veterans. I am a veteran, a disabled veteran. I fell 36 feet off the cargo nets in basic training. When I regained consciousness, I saw a drill sergeant and snapped to attention. He ordered me to take the at ease position and sent me to Fort Dix Hospital for evaluation. Three hours later, a medic found me where I'd been shoved into a side room and forgotten about. He jerked my little finger in place and asked me what had happened. Then he told me to walk down to x-ray to see if my back was broken. But my lifelong pain is nothing compared to the service people who get shoved into a body bag and shipped home in a box and lay beneath the sod in our national cemeteries or active duty troops, one of whom each day blows their brains out or jumps to their death, or veterans who are three times as likely to kill themselves as the general population and twice as likely to be homeless. 
Our troops and veterans, yes, I believe we are called on to walk a mile or two. As a veteran, I confess, I'd sure like to be thanked that way. As a pastor, I started this introduction with a reflection on scripture. I have related the story of Simon's service. I've shown how it relates to Jesus' teaching about the second or extra mile. I proclaim as a Christian preacher that God incarnate Jesus Christ calls us to walk the extra mile for enemy troops. I call on all Americans to do the same for our troops. That's our first reading. And the second reading... Very nice. The second reading is the story of my call to ministry, and it's called The Rose, after a sign of what I saw in the middle of a crisis. The sound of the phone ringing over the law student's conversation was unwelcome. My job of managing the school's bookstore during rush was hard enough without any interruptions. I looked over as Latoya, my assistant, picked up the receiver with one hand while the fingers of her other hand continued to dance over the cash register key. It was Larry, I expected on the phone. Thank God for Larry. Although Mr. Stewart often in ran his efforts, Larry tried to be a fair arbitrator in company politics. He was also there for me when I needed him. Once at the peak of another book rush, I had to call Larry with the news that my father had had a heart attack. Larry dropped everything and took over my store so I could get to Dad's deathbed. Larry even did international folk dancing, which I enjoyed. Latoya caught my eye and called out, Mr. Stewart's on the line. And my response was, great. What would be the disruption from Mr. Stewart? Leaving my workstation, I marched through the phone with a sense of dread. But surely Larry would get him off my back. <coughs> A line of impatient lawyers glared as I edged my way through the mob. Several wanted information which I provided as I walked. Being demand during rush was typical. Once during rush, a student followed me into the men's room. <laughs> and while I sat on the toilet, a voice from outside my booth suddenly asked which outline was best for Lowenthal's con law. <laughs> I continued answering as I squeezed myself along Behind the front counter, Latoya rang up books as fast as the attempt could flash the covers to her. She had cranked out receipts before everything was in bags. Another attempt collected signatures on credit card slips. Stepping over stacks of purchases lined up on the floor, I wedged myself into the corner by the phone. Mr. Stewart asked, Are you sitting down? <laughs> and I thought, What are you, nuts? <laughs> Have you ever bothered to come out to our stores during Buck Rush? Where would I put a chair? <laughs> I sighed inwardly, propped myself against the glass enclosed cabinet where we kept the ring, class ring samples and said yes. Mr. Stewart intoned, Larry has been shot and killed in his home. I replaced the receiver. I walked back in the daze. I came back to my workstation with my head in my hands. I said more to myself than the student in front of me. That's odd. Larry, my friend and boss, has been shot and killed. The student awkwardly muttered, I'm sorry. I snapped myself back into the word mode with, take this refund, fill out the information on the bottom, and you can receive cash at either cash register or make a purchase. Details came in during the day. Bizarre details. It seemed that Larry's Folk dancing world was quite different than the one I'd known in San Diego. There, Mom and I danced in City Park's building with only water to drink. Among Larry's crowd, folk dancing was done in private club where liquor was served and drugs were used. Larry and his dancing friends were involved in other more dangerous activities. One of these was Russian roulette. Mm -hmm. The news I was being forced to accept was that Larry, who had relied on for good sense, was not only dead but had killed himself. Larry, my rational, reliable boss, who I thought I'd known as a friend, had gotten high in his home, put a revolver to his head, and blown his brains out of his skull. And this madness happened in the context of folk dancing, which I had known as wholesome. 
during the rest of that long day, LaToya quietly did her job, but also served as my sounding board. She grew concerned as each new detail of the news bewildered me. Finally, in a lonely afternoon, she offered to close up so I could leave, for once I agreed. I showed LaToya how I wanted the checks, credit card slips, and cash bundled and placed in the safe. I'd have to come in early the next day, hopefully I could get to the bank. Reconciling receipts and making reports would have to wait. It was risky. Management preferred daily receipts, which that time of year told them the tens of thousands of dollars we'd taken each night to the night bank's night drop. My predecessor had been fired for denying deposits, and I couldn't fa afford to fall behind during those 12 to 15 hour days. But I needed to be away. I prayed in the morning I could get to the bank. I prayed no undecipherable problems would prevent me from having my manager's reports ready for the next day's noontime courier. Then I left her church. I planned, as I always did during Book Rush, to arrive halfway through the Bible study group I co-led at United University Church. But arriving early would give me time to myself, time to pray, and time to ask for God for guidance. As I approached our sanctuary's Italian Romanesque facade, I noticed the Hebrew figures in the bas relief. David stroked his harp. Adam held the dagger and flaming cauldron of sacrifice. Moses grasped the scroll of Torah. Elijah clasped the prophetic mantle. I walked into the cloister, two kneeling angels faced each other when the body of Jesus had lain in his tomb above me. As I opened the chapel door, the cool interior was lit only by the glow of pastel stained glass. Filtered afternoon light reflected off of cream-colored textured stucco walls. I settled into a pale oak pew. Then I saw it. On the altar was a single white rose and a brushed aluminum vase. I hurried toward the office and caught our church secretary on her way out. She explained that the rose had been placed by the mother of a 20-year-old student. Her daughter had been a member of USC's marching band. An auto accident had suddenly ended her life. A memorial had been held that day. I returned to my pew. I turned around and looked through the open doors of the narthex. There I contemplated one of our few stained glass picture windows. Santa Barbara, a patron saint of architects and victims of Seth and death, stared back at me. I remembered the window was dedicated to the architect's office, killed at 20 in an automobile accident. She too had been a member of USC's marching band. She had died over 50 years earlier. Such similar tragedies spanning so many years. I sat in the sacred space of her sanctuary, though still bewildered by the sudden news of Larry's son since this death, I felt comforted. I was where others had come in confusion. I could feel there was a real need for people to feel God's presence, especially in intense periods in their lives. I realized that faith communities endure as anchors in the uncertain flow of human life. I felt enveloped by the church and called to serve. Soon I would become a lay speaker and preach. Next, I would offer the role of God's representative to the dying and bereaved. Then, after seminary, I would don the stole of a pastor and offer believers the presence of God in word and sacrament. That's our second reading. I can do another reading or I can open it up for questions. What is your pleasure? This is called My Basic Job. When I enlisted in the Army, my nephew asked a question. I, at 25, was still six foot two. I've shrunk since then. He, at eight years old, came up to my chest. Uh, he looked up with his little boy brown eyes. He addressed me with a familiar family nickname, Uncle Igor. Why do you want to kill people? What he means? You join the army. That's what they do. Oh, I'm going to be a draftsman and draw plans for buildings, I said. At basic training, I was injured. 
For safety reasons, on my first trip to the rifle range, I was off the firing line. They sent me down instead into the target pits. There we mounted white cloth targets with black human silhouettes on frames. We hoisted the targets above grade. A volley of shots rang out. We lowered the targets on the white bordering areas. We pasted little black patches over the bullet holes. Inside the human silhouettes, white patches were pasted on black. He raised the targets. Drill sergeants with scopes on the firing line kept scores. Unaccounted lot <coughs> rounds were complete misses. Black patches on white were near misses. Each white patch on the black human wet was scored as a hit or a kill. It didn't take long to realize that my nephew was right. The Army trains each soldier to kill people. Not all military missions require killing, but many do. And most all service members must be ready to kill. My time patching, pacing patches on human cells was only the first lesson. My second lesson came when I moved through a firing course shooting human-shaped pop-up targets. Training for killing even continued as I prepared for my non-combat role. My military occupational specialty, or MOS, was construction drafting. My advanced individual training involved no weapons, but I was called up on to perform extra duty. The cash at the finance company needed, required guarding over Thanksgiving. The regular guards wanted to spend the holiday with family. Lowly trainees can do that. I'd earned a BA before I enlisted, so the Army added me rank. By contract, I came in as a PFC and became a specialist for in six months. There were six months of delays be because I was injured in basic and because of when my AAT class, that means in spec four, I was class leader. So my company commander was surprised when I volunteered. I expected to do this guard duty with an M16, but our standard issue rifle was not the best weapon for the confines of the jail-like cell in the, in the finance company cage. Shotguns were used. And we were required to train with those weapons, so I found myself qualifying with a double barrel shotgun I didn't know how much to brace myself before taking my first shot. The backside knocked me, the backfire knocked me on my backside. When I got word back out back to the company commander, I became a supernumerary, which is supposed to be an honor. But in my case, it meant Specialist Fours, formerly part of the Thanksgiving guard detail, but keep them on standby. Use those who can state safely use shotguns. Friday after Thanksgiving, I was in the mess hall having my breakfast. A woman from the guard detail sat down at the table next to me. She told a story about her duty the night before. Robbers had attempted to shoot their way into the finance company's cage. She had shot one in the face with both barrels. I moved away. I wanted to keep my food in my stomach. I did not need to know that she had blown somebody's head off. The call to be ready to kill disturbed me. I was left behind during basic as, as a barrack orderly. I studied my Bible and saw a chaplain. On leave, I went to the Quakers meeting house in Philadelphia. I walked in in uniform into a room with William Penn's portrait. Someone I spoke with pointed out that William Penn had been a fine swordsman. In time, God had called on Penn to put down his sword and become an early pacifist. I thought in time God might call on me to put down my sword. When I arrived in my permanent post, I was issued a weapons card. When so ordered, I took that card to our company's arms room. The outer grill through the door would be standing open. The top half of the Dutch door would be turned inward. Over a counter built into the door's bottom half, I would happen to hand in my weapons card. Our company armor would look at my card and find my assigned rifle. Yearly, I went with my M16 to the range to maintain my marksmanship. Whenever we went on alert or to the field, I would carry my sword, my rifle, the sword of a modern soldier. I explained to my young nephew what I would do in the Army. I said I would draw plans for building. I did so through subordinate draftsmen, but we never took our drafting fields out into the field. 
-hmm. Nor did I take my calculator in which I totaled the amounts of building materials of the cost of construction. Nor did the design officer and I take our engineering manuals we used to write specification. He holstered his pistol. I slung my rifle. In the field, we set up our brigade's command post. We left our peacetime role as draftsmen, soils analysts, and surveyors. We assumed our wartime role, soldiers patrolling the perimeter of our encampment. My boss, the peacetime design officer, became a combat engineer. His pistol would help defend the command post at close range. In the field, we rehearsed what they do in the Army, which is to wage war. A drill sergeant during basic had summarized what war meant for any soldier and me. You may think it is your job to die for your country. It is your job to make sure some other sucker, presumably an enemy soldier, dies for his country. In other words, what I, as a soldier, could be called on to do in the Army was to kill people, the enemy. My little nephew, looking up his nephew at his uncle, had spoken more truth than I was ready to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have one. A question and a comment, really. Uh, thank you for reading Santa Barbara. That's always been my favorite piece. Um, All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't think I ever asked you this. What made you begin with Simon's service? That's the beginning of the book. It just seemed logical. Okay. I. I don't know. I, I don't have any better explanation than that. It's just the beginning of the book. Yeah. All right. I know. That. It <laughs> kind of sets up the rest of the book that you you got to thank the troops because they do something and you're called upon by God to do so. I mean that's that's the premise of the book. I have a question. What's that? Any um, suggestions on what we could do as non-military people? Whenever you see a soldier, try not to judge them. The, the guys who came back from Vietnam were accosted as baby killers. You know, uh, they did their duty, and except for a few of them that got, went berserk and killed people that they shouldn't have killed, they did their duty. It's, I, it mystifies me why God permits us to continue to have war, particularly with nuclear weapons where we can do the whole whole planet, you know, it just doesn't make sense to send guys off and have them come back 100% disabled. And just, you know, God ought to organize things a little better than that, but it is what it is. You know, that is the way the world is organized right now, and the guys who caught up in that mechanization of, of armies doing what they can with these crazy people that are taking off people's head and Iraq and you know, I, I, I just I just don't get it uh, this potency for violence but I guess we live in a fallen world you know one day we'll get up to heaven and we'll demand God and say what do you have in mind what was that nonsense all about and maybe God has spent eternity explaining because it doesn't make much sense to me Jane how long did it take to write your book and what was how um how what was your process with it did you know it was going to be a book i mean because i know you i've been doing stories. i've been doing speeches and i've been writing things ever since the army i had no idea that i was ever going to write a book about army experiences i was uh amy uh signed me up with sam as a book coach and I started writing, started organizing the things that I had. I started uh, uh, giving sections of this uh, book as speeches at Toastmasters. I orally composed things. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, I would practice them, and I'd rewrite them, and I'd practice them aloud, and I'd rewrite them with oral those, the way I, I work. Mm. What's your next book going to be about? Uh, spiritual insight training for veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, how to use the disciplines of prayer, worship, confession, all the spiritual disciplines to deal with the problems that veterans have. In fact, it's written 
I need to find a publisher. I need to polish it a little bit. It's first draft. First drafts need work. There's a kind of obscene comment about what first drafts are, but mm -hmm. uh, um, Hemingway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you have to you, you have to work on it. You have to polish that. Are you uh, giving me a sign that time is? We're, we're doing a fine on time. Does anybody else have a question? I have one more question, if I may. Uh, my 21-year-old nephew is in the Army. He's going to Afghanistan, I think, in December. Wow. And again, is there any, any, any suggestions for me to be of support to him? Keep his head down. <laughs> Besides that. <laughs> Well, realize, realize they're going to train him. The probability of having to look somebody dead square in the face and blow their brains out is pretty low. You're usually at a long distance from them. But the problem is things are so ambiguous. You know, some kid comes up and you don't know if they've got a grenade or something else like that. So all of the rules of war, if you don't, mess with civilians and you only know, kill people in uniform, so they aren't uniforms. So it's it's a very nebulous, morally fraught enterprise. And they're going to mess with his head, the services are. Mm -hmm. Because the only way you can make men go out and do some of the things that you have to do as a soldier is you have to mess with their heads. But realize, after he gets out, he'll get over that with support. And pray that he doesn't get a limb blown off or suffer from traumatic brain injury, which is the thing which they do, you know, the, they're pretty protected inside their vehicles, then a grenade goes off and their brains go up against their skull and they're, they're disabled the rest of their lives, you know. And he's going to see things that are going to make him question morality. Uh, but he's going to be in a group of men that are going to try and support each other. Okay. Is it Army or? Army. Army. All right. They're not as hardcore as the Marines. Marines are nuts. They're just nuts. I mean, uh, well, there was a guy from the Marines here. I think he left. I think he got impatient that we didn't start right off. Oh well, whatever. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I was just going to ask you, um, what did you learn about yourself going through the process of writing and publishing this book? Well, I learned that I had a calling to help veterans. Uh, I knew I had a calling from God to help people in general. But I didn't realize the knowledge that I had, the specific knowledge on how I can help specific guys that have gone through it. I've always kind of discounted my service because the closest to combat that I came was the Attorney General for Germany was machine gunned down in front of a barracks. Uh, I didn't actually go into war. I didn't have to pull a trigger and kill somebody. I didn't watch my buddy beside me get blown up or anything else like that. But there's a certain camaraderie that you get by putting on the uniform and knowing somebody that can force, can order you to kill. Uh, and you can be put in a situation where it's inevitable that you can get killed. There's something about that. And just shortcuts, knowing uh, military discipline and knowing what it's like to be in uniform. I can talk with guys. I was at a hospital talking with a guy who Grove an M1 tank in Afghanistan. And I knew all about the trouble he had with his squad leader and what happened to him when he got busted. And I knew that was an Article 15 according to the Code of Military Justice because I, I just know that because I served. Mm -hmm. So I, I have I have I have a specific thing that I can do for specific people. Mm -hmm. It's not just generally. Oh, I'll find a church somewhere and somebody might like me. There's a group of, of men, mostly men, some women, that are walking wounded that, that uh, can use my help 
made it through the book or mm -hmm. through doing chaplain services, uh, that sort of thing. That's what I've learned about myself. There's a specific knowledge that I have that's got a specific use. I think I've said that in about three times as many words as it needed. Yeah. <laughs> Very well said. Anybody else have any questions? Edgar, the, um, you gave a statistic about the, the rate of suicide yeah. among um, veterans. What, what did you say? Three times the normal. Right. Statistically, it's three times what it would be if you, in yeah. the Bay population. I, I, I've heard the veterans are like killing themselves. 22, 22 a day. A day. Just my, um, <clears throat> my partner's son is a Marine. Um, who served in in um, Iraq, and he is just dealing hugely with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And um, he finds that it's hard for him to be open about it. With he feels it's hard for him to be open about it with 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 the military. No, and it is hard. It's like they because they, you're going to look yeah. weak, and you're not going to get promoted. Right. You know, they, they're, they're going to look down your nose at you like you're some kind of sicky and weaky. Right. And yeah. uh, which is tragic because the people that should be helping the troops are their commanders. Uh, the VA is trying to do something. Um, and when I was a volunteer chaplain there, we were trying to do things. Uh, when I was a chaplain down at the hospital in the San Jose, I was dealing with a homeless veteran. I could tell he came in and he was like a caged animal. Uh, uh, kind of a little off pacing. And they gave, well, they just gave him a voucher for some rooms for the night and cut him loose. He's back on the street now. They, they didn't do much for him, except they kept him from dying that day. You know, the, the support system for veterans with problems is, I think, woefully inadequate. That's, but I could get on my uh, little preaching stump here and really give you some, some stuff there. I just see too many walking wounded. Gone into the lockdown wards at Fort Miley. Um, the guys who are going to be there for four or five days, you know, they get off the street and they clean them up. They get them off drugs for and alcohol for a few days and uh, give them a room to where there's nothing sharp or dangerous. And uh, that's what they do for them. Then they cut them loose and they're back out there again with the little cardboard signs by the street, and, you know. You see a homeless person, the chance that they may be a veteran is, is fairly high. So, any other questions? I kind of want to thank you for what you do. And uh, also, tell everyone here, so you wonder what you can do or anybody can do is, you know, when you hear politicians talking to have to cut funding for vets. Right is to give them a call or write them a letter and tell them right. that just doesn't work right. for me. You know? Right, right. Yeah, talk to your politician about supporting the VA. The VA is underfunded and um, I, I know all about the VA, but they do, They, I must say that the VA here, I've got a wonderful uh, doctor, i got a wonderful uh, therapist. Um, I suffer, uh, from non-military related stuff, I suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome. So I got a little sense of what that is all about. And the guys that suffer because of combat, they, uh, when you add the stress of being on the street, they, they really need help. And help translates <coughs> to uh, support by the government. There's no, there's, there's no substitute for that. You, you gotta, uh, they, they pay the doctors well enough, but they're, they hard to, it's hard to keep specialists at the VA. I've been waiting for a long time to, for a podiatrist because they don't pay the podiatrist well enough to keep enough podiatrists around. I mean, it's just the reality. Uh, and whenever they want to buy, 
you know, it's only 1% of the population that are involved in military now. And if you're looking for an easy scapegoat, you know, okay, those veterans are getting too much. Take what they give them away. And more people are going to resonate with that than they're going to resonate with veterans because they're ignorant about what the veterans do. So you got to be thankful for veterans and all. Uh, um, because it's, I mean, my duty wasn't rough. I spent it in Germany chasing toy lines. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Top duty, drinking beer and chasing toy lines. Yeah. I forgot. I heard that the UC uh, San Francisco Medical Center has a veterans program or something in there for PTSD. Is it? The okay. UCSF has a cooperative relationship with Fort Miley, uh -huh. and so they have programs like that that they do. And I don't know where that's housed particularly. I don't know if it's housed at. Uh, the UCSF campus, I imagine it would be housed at Port Miley. They get them off the street for a while and they clean them up. My only problem with that, they clean them up for a while and they just put them out on the street again. You know, they don't really solve any problem. Uh, Torch to Plowshares is another organization that does good work. Uh, they are, they're in uh, the Presidio. They were started by a group of Vietnam vets and they use that uh, biblical image as the swords to plowshares and they have a residential program for housing homeless vets and training them with computers and everything else so they can get jobs mm. and they take they took an old barracks on the presidio and they recycled it and they also have uh, a home for vets up on uh, uh, treasure island they they do they do some good work and another group that is good is called uh, vets to vets it's a discussion group of vets because vets know how to talk to each other and belong to that and disabled American veterans does things now uh, I just got a notice from the national commander uh, suggesting that we write our congressman because uh, so that a disabled American Vets can use commissaries. You know, uh, there's 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 things that you can do. Veterans organizations, uh, contact veterans organizations, VFW, DAV, uh, American Legion. Uh, wounded warrior. I have a lot of fun with the wounded warriors. Is one. Uh, I belong to a group called the Scottish American Military Society. We mostly we shot around in kilts. You know, I don't know that we yeah. do anything socially all that useful, but we have a lot of fun strutting around in our kilts. Any other questions? Siobhan, do you got a question? No. You don't have a question, okay. Right. Amy, you got a question? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, you didn't have to ask a question if you don't want to. We see a lot of homeless people, don't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, we saw we a lot. Do, we do, yeah. and yeah. you've yeah. given us a really good insight about what to think about mm -hmm. when we see. I'm sure you're right that most of those folks we're looking at oh, wow. are vets, or a, lo a yeah. lot of them. Yeah, yeah. And we can be talking about them. Well, well, there's a, a when you're in the yeah. Army, you're supported. She's, she's doing you know, everybody's taking care of everything down to how you organize your underwear in your drawer. You know? mm -hmm. And... Uh, and when you get out, you no longer have that support, and you rely on, on on yourself to take care of yourself. Some of these guys can't do it, especially if they had their brains kind of scattered from a, a wound, or they've done something that makes them question their worth as an individual because they did something that is morally questionable, which is war. Uh, and they have a hard time taking care, so they end up on the street. And uh, and if they're on the street for too long, they get even crazier and crazier, and then they do things like jump off the Golden Gate Bridge or find a pistol and do themselves in. 
Um, I had a friend who served as a missionary and went to another country, went to um, Tanzania actually. And I think that's another thing that happens is people get kind of a culture shock because right. he, he was over there for three years and it took him at least another three years before he felt like he was home again. Right. When right. he got back. Yeah. And that was just religious mission, missionary. Right. Oh. It wasn't war. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, had a little bit of culture shock coming home from Germany. Germany is not that much different culturally than we are. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a little bit of things that are weird. Do we have time for one more question or one more comment? Anybody? I haven't heard from you, sir. Nothing? Oh, okay. Thank you so much for your presentation tonight.